hello. And today we're actually going to talk about rubber. <laughs> and rubber is something that is essential to our way of life. But very few people understand that. So natural rubber is what we're talking about. Now, natural rubber is produced by trees and other plants. But this is how we produce it in the world today. So you take a tapping knife and you cut an incision in the bark of the tree, and the latex dribbles out and is collected into those little cups. This process hasn't changed for 120 years. This is how it's still done today. So how much do we actually produce in this way? Well, last year it was 14 million tons. And this is, this is a lot. But how, lo how much is it? So what's that elephant doing there? You know, the elephant in the room. So I have calculated out how much that is in full-grown male African elephant equivalents per minute. Okay, so what do you think? Do you think it's one? How about two? Three? Well, it's actually 12 elephants a minute collected into that little cup by hand. So pretty amazing. So how did you get here today? And did you realize that all came, you all came here thanks to natural rubber? So who came by a car or a bus? Yep, OK, natural rubber. Those tires are 50% natural rubber. And there's other rubber things in that car, too. Did anybody walk here today? Oh, I don't see any walkers with the lights. But if you did, your shoes have got some natural rubber in there. And if you bicycled, same thing. And certainly, if you came in from out of state, uh, you certainly did that thanks to natural rubber. There's actually 50,000 different things in your everyday life made with natural rubber. So the name rubber comes from the ability of it to rub out pencil marks. And so they had to put the eraser on there as, a, as the quintessential rubber article. But, you know, rubber bands. My team sometimes call themselves the rubber bandits. And uh, then what would a children's party be without balloons? Those are made from rubber as well. If you play sports, in, and it rains, which it does in Ohio, uh, you can't catch the ball very well unless you've got sporting gloves on with natural rubber fronts, because they have wet grip and you can catch a ball in the rain. And airplane tires. So have, we, have any of you taken a plane flight? Yeah? Yeah, quite a lot of you have been on a plane. Those tires are 100% natural rubber. If you put any synthetic in there, you're going to blow up your tire on landing or have a very good chance of that. And we don't want to do that. So where does it come from? We use a lot in the States. We import about a million tons a year. But it comes from Southeast Asia. This is where it's actually produced. So even though it comes from Brazil, from the original trees, 89% of it is grown in Southeast Asia, the opposite side of the world. West Africa has about 8%. And South America, where the tree originates from, only 3%. Now, the USA, well, we got nothing. So we don't have any of our own production in the US. Now, this wouldn't be so bad, except that this rubber supply is not secure. So there's a pending rubber apocalypse that I really think you ought to know about. Now, this is caused by a whole bunch of converging factors. So we have climate change. This is warming up the areas and restricting the growth area where you can grow these trees. They're very specific about the climate and conditions they like to grow in. There's also a foot deforestation moratorium that the World Wildlife Fund is sponsoring, saying you can't keep cutting down virgin rainforests to put in new rubber trees or oil palm trees. This is not something that's going to be permitted any longer. Um, and then, of course, there's political considerations as well. But the most important thing is disease. So this is South American leaf blight, what it looks like. There's many diseases that affect the Havea plantations, but this is a fatal one. You get this and you die. And it's made particularly difficult because trees, if you see this healthy plantation, they're all grown as clones. So they're genetically identical, tree after tree after tree. So if one gets a disease, they're all going to get it, because they're all growing in contact with each other, only about eight feet apart. So their leaves are all touching, their roots are all touching. So contagion can spread very, very quickly. And then the trees will die. So what would we have to do? What can we do with 14 million tons? 
So what, why don't we just use synthetics? Well, I pointed out there's some things you can't do, and I have a little demonstration here. So this is, this is natural rubber. Okay, this is an example of a synthetic rubber. <laughs> so we need the natural. And so I got into this over 30 years ago, rather by happenstance, and I quickly realized it's a very fascinating, well, I find it fascinating, a biological and scientific system to work on. Um, but when you actually got into when I got into it, the, the need for the rubber, that we have to have biodiversity in our rubber supply, became a very compelling thing, and I've never left the field since. It's not easy to do, but it's necessary to do. And so as I've worked on this, I've worked in government, industry, academia. I'm at the Ohio State now. I have my own company as well. Um, this was all to try and make this goal achievable. Get rubber into the US, that we can be self-sustaining and, 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 and protect supplies. And so there are new, support, new domestic sources of natural rubber. So this is what we work on in Ohio. This is the rubber root dandelion. It actually comes from Kazakhstan, of all places. And we like to call it Buckeye Gold. Uh, but anyway, this field was in Ohio, and we can grow this as an annual crop. The rubber's in the roots. And then this is Waiuli, which is a shrub from the Chihuahuan Desert. And you can grow that up, cut the tops off, extract the rubber, and then the plants will regrow. So you can get a harvest every year. Now, we also developed a new production system for the dandelion crop, and this is a hydroponic system. So you can grow the roots down, cut them off, and then regrow them. So in this system, you can harvest every two months. And you can also, in an indoor controlled environment agriculture system, grow them like 12 high. So this can be a very rapidly scalable system if leaf blight did start to wipe out significant production uh, capability in Southeast Asia. Now, the rubber from both of these crops is of high quality, and this is really important. There's 2,500 plants that can make rubber, but a lot of them don't make what the sort of rubber that we need, and a lot of them you can't farm. So anyway, here's some tires made back from World War II for Waiuli, and the most recent ones, we have Continental making dandelion tires in Germany. They're all prototypes, of course. And then in uh, the US, both Cooper, shown here, and Bridgestone have made Waiuli tires. Now, however, if you think about tires, this is 70% of the natural rubber supply. We can't make tires from 10 acres, you know, or 100 acres, or one hydroponic farm. So we must have a lot more farms and a lot more processing plants before we can make that type of product. So a great deal is involved with scaling, scaling up from the original idea. So I've just popped in a story here about the electric car. The electric cars actually predate the petrol cars but they never got anywhere until very recently. They weren't reliable, they were too expensive, they weren't accessible, there was no national network of fueling stations. So it was very, very difficult for these cars to get on the road. And by the way, they do have rubber tires. <laughs> so nowadays, though, you can get a leaf or a vault or a hybrid. You know, the Prius really paved, paved the way to this. And so probably many of you at this point have something like this. Can I just have a show of hands? But how many of you remember your parents having an electric car in the 50s or 60s, or your grandparents? Yeah, I'm not seeing any hands for that. Because they, weren't, they weren't available. The technology was there in many ways, but they weren't available. So what we're doing with Waiuli and Dandelion, we have to develop all that scaling infrastructure. We have to have farming, we have to have processing, we have to have product development, we have to be able to make all the things that we currently make out of natural rubber from Havea. So this is just showing you an example. So here is harvested Waiuli. So we bale that up using conventional equipment, take it off to a processing plant. We have a pilot. Take the leaves off. We don't want, to, don't want those messing up our tires or our gloves. And then we can then you basically make that Waiuli into a Waiuli milkshake. So we grind it up in water, which breaks open all the rubber-containing cells and releases all the little rubber particles into the aqueous medium. Now, we then separate those out from the homogenate, like you do cream from milk. We actually do it with a hot milk separator. So none of this is new equipment, it's just putting it together in a new way. 
And what we end up with is the gas, very high energy, can use that for all sorts of things, and then also the latex. So this is like the milkshake, and we spin it, and that little tube there shows the latex, and that white is floating to the top like cream. So to do this in new rubber crops, premium niche markets must come first. So Waiuli latex, well, here's a bucket of latex being produced. It's got some very interesting properties. So for example, it doesn't cross-react with type 1 latex allergy. It's also very soft, strong, and stretchy. So we can make things like this particular glove. I have an example here. So in our lab, we can make one glove at a time or four condoms. And it does make... <laughs> <laughs> And it makes a beautiful condom, ever so soft and stretchy. <laughs> and so, and anyway, so here's, here's, here's a nice glove. Now, FDA at the moment makes you wear two gloves on each hand. So now your surgeon's doing surgery in boxing gloves. But this one will protect you from disease and radiation instead of needing two different gloves to do those two processes. Dandelion, well, we've also done the processing for that. So however you make your roots, we then use a water-based process and get the rubber out as a solid. Now this rubber is almost identical to Hervea rubber, which is very nice for existing manufacturers. However, where's the premium? So we think actually the performance premium will be in things like sporting goods or high-performance shoes, where they're quite expensive, but there's very little rubber in there. You just have it, need to have a bit, and so you can have a much higher raw material price with making very little effect on your retail. So, how are we going to make this happen? You know, think about biofuels. A huge amount of investment has been done over recent years in biofuels, even though we already had solar, wind, water, uh, uh, petroleum, geothermal, all sorts of fuel sources. And I'm not saying that was a waste of investment, because it isn't, but we don't have any rubber. And there's been virtually very little investment into making us have our own rubber. So what I want to see is, I want to be able to drive down Route 66 or 83 or 71 past the fields of dandelions or of uh, Waiuli, seeing my processing plants looming in the distance. You know, even self-sustainability in rubber will create an enormous number of jobs. We'll bring jobs back from Southeast Asia, bring our manufacturing back here. And eventually, we should be able to make the US a rubber exporting country. So thank you very much.